Uh, well, welcome, Dave Coleman. I'm so glad to have you be a part of us this morning. Uh, and uh, so let's begin with a word of prayer. All right. Heavenly Father, God, I just thank you for this, this opportunity. Father, for the service of Dave Coleman and his legal center. Uh, and uh, Lord, I just pray now for this in the short time that we have, that you will just use our words and uh, this, may this be a blessing to those that watch this uh, in the days ahead. Um, but I also pray that you'll you bless Dave and, and his and his son as uh, and, and his office in the work that they have day by day in these challenging days. Father, we are thankful that we can look to you in all things. So thank you, God, for being with us during these hours and during this time now. In the name of Jesus, Amen. Amen. Well, Dave, hey, I want to just spend a minute. I was um, I was looking at your. Um, I, I was looking at your bio, um, and I was, I, it, was, it was really good for me to do that. I hadn't looked at it for quite some time, um, and um, you, have, have, you have quite a background, uh, truly, and I think it's worth uh, spending a little time talking about that. Uh, your, your dad, of course, um, I didn't know him greatly, but I, I, I had referenced this recently, um, of his work in, in Lansing as a circuit court judge. But I see he came from Gladstone, Michigan, played football up there, and also played football at the University of Michigan. Right. Of time until he got injured, was in the war, and all those kinds of things. And then here, here you were, um, following in his footsteps in, in the legal profession. And you also played football. You, you played at Northwood Institute. Actually, I played basketball. Oh, you played basketball. You were yeah, basketball. I wasn't my thinner days. I, I was not much of a football player. <laughs> And I see your, your son also, who's on staff with you. It's, it's Stephen, isn't it? Or is right, it? right. He's been an attorney for 10 years now, yeah. Okay, and he was a basketball player, was, was a football player. Right, basketball. basketball. He played yeah. Division One for a couple years, yeah. yeah. So fantastic. And, uh, but uh, those things are all really cool, but I think the, the, the really special thing is uh, that you are, you are Christian people. Your dad was a Christian, your mom. You're following in that legacy, and you know when I first uh, became aware of you when I when I got involved in ministry. I see you started in, in law in 1982 in Lansing, and I went full time in ministry in in 1987. I think my path already cro crossed yours early on, um, not just incidentally. I think we had discussions, but you've been serving for a long time in the name of Jesus, and I think that is one of the things that has just really stood out to me is. Um, there's always been an attorney in Michigan that, that persons like myself could look to. And I just thank you for that, for your steadiness and your faithfulness and your excellence. So thank you so much, Dave. Oh, well, thank you. We just thank the Lord for giving us opportunities over the years. And we certainly appreciate all the great work that you have done over the years. And, you know, it, it's just tremendous <laughs> what you're doing. So any small way we can help, we're, we're glad to. Well, your presence just always being there. You're always a person that I can look to and say, Dave, what do I do about this? And so uh, thank, just thank you for, for that. But, um, you know, there are lots of things that, that we can talk about. Um, but one of the things that I would like to, to first of all, talk about is um, the Planet Fitness um, battle that you that you fought. That's what that started about four or five years ago. Right. What a big battle. Tell, can you tell us a little bit about that and where that's at presently? Sure. Um, it was the situation where um, Yvette Cormier, who's our client, had um, a membership at Planet Fitness up in Midland and was working out one Saturday morning and went in the women's locker room. And while she's there and just about getting ready to take a shower and, you know, get ready to go, uh, a gentleman walks in, six foot four, 250 pound man wearing a wig and starts preparing to use the women's facilities. So obviously she was quite shocked, went out to the main desk to say, hey, there's a man in the women's locker room. Uh, can you do something about this? And she was told, oh, no, he can because he, he is, uh, uh, believes he's a woman. And so therefore he can pick and choose which facilities he wants to use. And we have a no judgment zone and all of that. And she objected to that. And she didn't create a scene or cause any big problems that way. But what she did do was notify other women at the, the facility, hey, be careful because they're letting men into the women's locker rooms. Well, they didn't, Planet Fitness didn't like that. And so they terminated her membership. 
So one thing led to another. We filed a lawsuit. Actually, most of the counts got dismissed, invasion of privacy, other things that we had brought. But one of the counts dealing with Consumer Protection Act and the failure of Planet Fitness to notify their members and potential members that that was their policy, uh, the Supreme Court ruled that that was a cause of action that could move forward. So the case got sent back down to the circuit court. That's where it is right now. And in fact, we're in settlement discussions. And really all we're asking is that the, uh, the organization make their policy known. And so, you know, give people a heads up ahead of time so they know what they're signing up for. It's a Consumer Protection Act sort of thing. So we're in settlement discussions. We'll see what happens there. Hopefully it'll be resolved soon. So Dave, when, when, did, when was that first, when, when did that break? What year was that? Oh, it was back in 2015 or 16. I'm not exactly sure. Cause we had appeals, you know, went to the court of appeals and then it went up to the Supreme Court. And then we finally got a ruling uh, our way from the Supreme Court. So, and now it got sent back down. So it's been, it's been around for about four years or so. Yeah. It's incredible how these things are so long lasting. Yeah. It? Yeah. And of course is. that's, that's part of your world for sure. Yeah. Uh, when now in, in relationship to like bathrooms or locker rooms, where mm -hmm. are we at in this country right now? I mean, we you know, we know that Target, for example, they, they have open, an open bathroom policy. So apparently that's the law of the land. Is that, is that correct? That, that well, it's, it's not the law of the land, but it's what a lot of private businesses are starting to enforce. It's why I don't shop at Target. <laughs> you know, I don't go there because of yes. their policy. Right. Um, you know, I have no problem with businesses and private companies setting up single use restrooms, you know, that could be used by either a man or a woman, but it's a single use restroom. Like mm -hmm. you see them a lot of times as a family restroom, right. you know, yes. sort of a thing. And that's fine. Then you don't have the issue. But to say that women have to put up with men, biologically intact men coming in to use the women's mm -hmm. uh, restrooms. And there have been reports all over the country, as you know, Bill, about people, mm -hmm. you know, assaults and things that have been happening in these bathrooms because of these policies. Um, and, and just common sense and common decency would dictate against such a policy. But apparently, a lot of more businesses these days are, are caving in to the mob and to uh, requests uh, for these sorts of things. So we have a lawsuit going right now where we we're suing the Williamson School District just outside of Lansing because of their transgender bathroom locker room policy. And we're in federal court in the Western District right now on that lawsuit. So there have been interpretations of federal laws dealing with certain situations and employees, but not there's no law across the board that says that that's something that's allowed. Also in Michigan, is specifically our Elliott Larson Act, our Civil Rights Act, does not include gender identity, transgender, sexual orientation. Those are not protected classes under our laws here in Michigan. So in fact, the law goes our way on these issues, but you wouldn't know that if you listen to the media. Dave, it was interesting that you brought up Williams, Williams, uh, Williamston because you also graduated from there, I believe. Correct? Yeah, that's my high school. I'm an alum, yeah. So it's interesting yeah. that you here you were, you're, you're, came out of that, uh, that school, and um, I'm sure you're thankful for Williamston and your the yeah. background, and yet here you are fighting a battle on behalf of Christians in that community. Um, right. and, uh, not just Christians, but just well-being and, and decency. Uh, exactly. Tell, tell, tell how that broke. I mean, and it's, I heard just a little bit about it. It sounded like there was quite a fight uh, fought uh, from the standpoint of our position. Um, is that is that correct? Tell, tell yeah, there were a number of yeah, there were a number of parents uh, who came together in the Williamson School District, opposed it. The school board voted for it. Now tell about, it was, tell I think about, it was a six to one decision, something like that. Okay, I think, against yeah. the parents, against yes, the parents. Uh, in favor of allowing men in the women's locker rooms and that sort of thing in bathrooms, and so that's why we filed suit. And in fact, there was a recall effort in Williamson because of those votes. And the board president actually got recalled. Um, a couple of other board members survived the recall. So I don't know, you know, it's, I don't understand communities who want to adopt these sorts of policies. I, you know, is, is, I, I is think that, it's a sign of the times of what we're living in. Is that, that, that's probably shocking to you, isn't it? In your it opinion? is, it's very much so that uh, 
somebody would not be recalled for for that type of out there left wing progressive type of uh, position absolutely and so that's the practice right now in the williamson in the williamson school system right right wow that, that's yeah there must be a lot of parents that are really i mean are there parents that have fled that school district and gone oh sure there? there's a number of parents who have left the schools and they're either homeschooling or private schooling that sort of thing so it happens all the time now, have you heard, is, is there, are there similar things going on in, in other school districts in, uh, in Michigan? Oh, all over the place, absolutely. Really? Yeah. And yeah. so are you engaged in some of those as well? Well, we've had some contacts with people help them in making their presentations to boards and things like that. But there aren't any, we're not involved in any other lawsuits right now other than the Williamston one. Mm -hmm. Dave, you know, having been, you graduated from high school, I think, in 1982, is that right? No, I actually graduated in 74. <laughs> See, I know I don't look that old, Bill. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm a 1974, and 74. I graduated from law school in 82. Okay. Now, at that that community then was, I would think, quite conservative still, correct, or not? Yeah, very much so. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was very conservative back there, small farming community. Now yes. it's more of a bedroom community for Lansing. Okay. Uh, the makeup has changed quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And Michigan State University. I would right, presume. exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So have, have you seen this, uh, this, this alteration uh, over time or did it, has it been something rather rapid or how would you characterize that? No, it's been over time. Um, you know, I'd say the last 15, 20 years is, is the demographics change, you know, uh, a lot more, more urban, you know, uh, type folks move into the area and they have different mindsets, I guess. Yeah. So Dave, as we, as I want to move into a, into a couple of other things as well, of course, um, now talking about um, churches and worship services and so on, I'm sure you've been following John McCarthy out, out at Grace Community Church Absolutely. in California. Um, ex express or give us an overview of that and where you see that is at the present time and the implications. Yeah, I think the implications are huge here. I don't care what the reason is. If the government can shut down churches and arrest pastors and fine them tens of thousands of dollars like they're trying to do to uh, Pastor MacArthur right now, and uh, what world are we living in? You know, we're not living in China or Russia, but yet we're being treated like that. And I don't care what the reason is. <laughs> There's, we have a First Amendment right to meet and exercise our religious beliefs, period. There's no, ex, there's no pandemic exception to the Constitution. And I don't know if you saw what happened just recently, like in the last day or so out in Idaho, there was a church having a meeting out in their parking lot where parishioners came. There was a few hundred people there. They were singing songs and all that. Three people got arrested yeah. in Idaho, for goodness sake. The very because they're outside, you know, singing and doing that. And we're not wearing a mask. In a That's very outrageous. In a very conservative, very conservative community, right? It's Doug, Doug Wilson's community. Yeah, so it's it's really pathetic what's going on, and in Michigan at least we've not run into that. We actually filed a lawsuit. We filed one of the first lawsuits in the country over churches being open right here in Michigan. We filed in federal court in Western District of Michigan on behalf of a number of churches, but we were also arguing on behalf of synagogues. You know. Um, Muslim folks, anybody, I don't care what your religious faith is, I could disagree with it theologically, but you have the right to meet, you know, like anybody else. Right. We brought, right. Our, we brought our lawsuit mm -hmm. early uh, May, the first week of May, because remember the, the legislature's approval of the governor's executive orders ended April 30th. Mm -hmm. So in less than a week, the governor, you know, had put out this executive order saying churches, you know, it was kind of real, ambiguous could right, churches right. meet or not that sort of thing so we filed our federal lawsuit the next day bill the governor revamped her executive order and made it clear churches could be open and nobody would be prosecuted and and churches and synagogues everybody could go ahead and meet so that's encouraging yeah we've that's, not had these problems in michigan 
that's that's wonderful, you know. And she's quite a tiger, so it, for her to back down like that was uh, yeah. You know, we were quite was. surprised that it was yeah. the very next day we filed the lawsuit, and the next day she amended her executive order. Now, again, that begs the question. I mean, I don't think her executive orders are legal and constitutional and all that, but at least she acknowledged that there's some freedom here for people to meet. So what did that look like? I, I, from the stand, one of the things that's encouraging is that you said a number of churches or some churches came to you in this regard. Um, yeah, we represented three specific churches from different parts of the state. One uh, an African-American church, huge member. You might know Pastor Butler, Keith Butler. Mm -hmm. um, he was the, uh, his, his church is four or 5,000 people on a Sunday morning. Um, and he has churches all around the country. It's a quite a large uh, organization. Then Pastor Chatfield up in uh, Northern Michigan, um, up towards the bridge. And then uh, Pastor Visdom, who's down in the Southwest part of the state. So we had churches from, Geographic, geographically all around the state that we represented. We had a number of other churches that wanted to join, but we just chose those three to move ahead with. So you did have, when you say you had a number of other churches, you know, sometimes we think the church is so quiet and sleepy, quiet and sleepy, and, and generally it is. But yeah. what, num what number of churches would you say um, joined together or you heard from? Well, we had, I don't know, eight or 10 churches that were interested in being uh, plaintiffs. Mm -hmm. And actually, once we filed and the word got out, we, we had other churches calling us and wanting to join, but we really didn't need to, not to make our point. And we only needed a, a few churches to, you know, to be the parties and they would represent everyone. So, so it worked out quite well. Dave, now in relationship to churches and worship, uh, the none, nonetheless, there's some, um, they, they had us in some ways, I'm talking about masking and, and social distancing. Um, Talk, talk about that that battle, if you would. Did you were you engaged in battling that, or or trying to keep them from um, totally, you know, shutting, nearly shutting us down? Give us a picture of that landscape, if you could. Sure. Yeah, I mean, the whole masking and social distancing and all that, of course, back in March and April, really wasn't an issue. <laughs> we were being told you didn't need to wear a mask back then, if you recall. Ma a mask didn't help you. There was no reason to wear a mask. Now it's flipped, and if you don't wear a mask, you're killing grandma or something, you know. Um, it's, it's ridiculous, but right now, you know, the way it's, it's set up in Michigan, you do not, when you go into church, if you don't want to wear a mask, you don't have to wear a mask. If you wear a mask, you can wear a mask. It's your choice. I mean, we're all adults. We can make reasonable and responsible choices for ourselves. If I'm 75 years old going into a church for a service, I might very well wear a mask, you know? I mean, I'm in a high risk group. If yeah. I'm 25 years old and going in to a church, I'm not gonna worry about it because the numbers are so infinitesimally lower, you know, for the risk right. to those folks in that age group. So people should be allowed to make their own reasonable and responsible choices. Yeah, now, now as far as grouping goes, or, you know, social distancing, is uh is there what's what is the standard in in relationship does, does there have to be a cordoning off yeah most churches what they're doing is they're structuring where if it's a family member you know group or something coming in they can all sit together because obviously they're a family group living together anyway uh, but beyond that they're trying to separate out six feet or so and most churches are doing that and maybe having folks in every other pew you know so there's not people in the pew right in front of you um, to try to create that distance uh, right now. Look, we can argue about the efficacy of that, but there are a lot of people who feel very strongly we should be doing that. And so I think most churches are going along with that at this point. Now, is there any legal standard or anything, any legal citation on that, or is it quite a- quite Well, it's just, the, it's just the governor's executive order, which again, in our opinion, is illegal and unconstitutional. And the Supreme Court should be ruling on that very soon here in Michigan. So we'll get a ruling on whether or not her orders are valid. And beyond that, regardless of what the Supreme Court rules, we have that petition drive, Unlock Michigan, to get rid of the 1945 law, which is what the governor is relying on right now. And they had, I, the last I heard a couple of days ago, over 500,000 signatures, and they're going to turn it in to the Secretary of State. So if those signatures are validated, that 340,000 of them are valid, 
then it'll go to the legislature and the legislature will pass that. It will become law and the 1945 law will be thrown out. And then the governor has no authority. Explain that 1945 um, executive order uh, more specifically, would you? Sure. People get confused because there are two emergency laws that, that get talked about all the time. There's a 1945 law that's been in place for a long, 75 years. And um, that law, though, had traditionally only been used for more local emergencies or disturbances, riots, disorder, public disorder, things like that. Um, back in 1976, a second law was passed for emergency powers for a governor. And the whole argument was, well, the 1945 law doesn't deal with epidemics and health crises and things like that. So we have to have another law in order to handle a health epi epidemic if something ever happens. So that was the argument, was the 45 law should, doesn't apply. Well, now, of course, they're applying it anyway here, you know, some 45 years later. Yeah. They, they forget those arguments, but that was the reason for the two laws. The 1976 law specifically says it deals with health pandemics, epidemics, things like that. The 45 law does not say that, but the governor's using both of them and that's the lawsuit. That's what a big part of the lawsuit is about that the Supreme Court's going to rule on. And the reason why it's so important is the 1976 law says the governor can enter emergency orders for a short period of time essentially a month, it's 28 days. After that, she has to have the legislature's agreement to continue any emergency. And she in fact did get the legislature's agreement back in April for a couple of weeks, it got extended to the end of April. But then after that, the legislature did not agree to extend it and she just kept going on anyway and issuing orders and claiming she had the authority under the 1945 law. So that's that's why these two laws are so important. The 1976 law puts some limitations on the governor and does not allow her to be a dictator ad infinitum. I mean, if her interpretation of that 1945 law is correct, then that means I could be elected governor the first day in office, Bill, declare an emergency, mm -hmm. and then keep it in place for four years. And I can be a dictator for four years under their interpretation. It's ridiculous. And, and if you think that's hyperbole, <laughs> or no, nobody's really going to do it. Well, this is a health crisis we're dealing with. Look what the governor did this week. What's the big executive order that's in all the media today? This very day, the governor issued an executive order on climate change. And we're going to have zero carbon emissions by 2050 and a whole elaborate scheme on you know energy and the use of coal and natural gas and all of that. What's that got to do with the pandemic? Nothing. She's just declaring an emergency. This is yeah. ridiculous. We don't live under a dictator. Mm -hmm. We have a republic. We have a representative Republican. And, and it's been denied us uh, under the guise of this health threat. And it's people need to wake up. I don't care how good your intentions are. You don't destroy our way of life and our form of government based on good intentions. We all know the old saying, you know, what good, where good intentions lead to. So this is ridiculous. She should have, she is required to work with the legislature and the other branches of government, and she's not. She's just doing whatever she wants. Dave, you, you hear criticisms, for, I'm sure, from in relationship to our state house and state senate, that we just don't have any stand-up people there are you sympathetic towards that or do you feel that they are the leadership of the Senate and the House are doing basically all that they can do? Do you think this is a problem for us today in the state of Michigan? Yeah, look, I, I think their hands are tied to a certain extent because of the way the courts have ruled up until now. The House and the Senate have both passed resolutions, done other things that they can do as, a, as the legislative bodies. Uh, could they do more? Uh, you know, I mean, we're now at a point of having the Supreme Court rule, and that's because in large part of what the legislature has been doing. But could they do more in being speaking out every day? Could they do more in maybe the purse strings? You know, they just passed the budget. Um, why not defund these various agencies that are illegally enforcing the governor's executive orders? Things like that. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that's the whole give and take of the legislative process, Bill. I don't, 
claim to know all the ins and outs of right. their, you know of what's going on. But I don't think it's fair to say that they're sitting back and doing nothing. I, that's not what I've seen. I think they're taking action and they're trying to take steps, steps legally to deal with these things. You, you know, you, you of course, have, as I have, um, have watched Michigan politics for a long time. We've, we've seen and been under, you know, Republicans, we've been under Democrats. But what we have in place right now in Lansing in relationship to our governor and our attorney general, uh, we've not seen the likes of, of these kinds of personalities um, or, uh, or, or so-called leaders in our lifetime. I'm sure of that. And Ever, it, right. Ever. Course, I mean, by, by far. I mean, you know, we've had right. Granholm, for example, and certainly she was a liberal, but uh, she wasn't operating as, um, as Whitmer is. Now, the question I have is, um, um, you know, we, we are very much aware of George Soros um, and his influence across the nation in the world, actually, this 90-year-old who is pouring millions upon millions of dollars into attorney general's uh, um, offices, races around the nation. He is a pro-criminal, anti-police uh, operative. Uh, and I, you know, I know I've heard someplace, but I guess the question I'm having is, ha did he have influence, persuasion in terms of financial backing of races in regards to our governor and our attorney general? Do you, do you know if, if that's the case? Because it's, it just seems like it's a little bit out of character what we have ended up with as far as our, our governor and our attorney general at this time. Well, yeah, I'm not aware specifically of any funding or you know financial assistance given to them by George Soros. That might be an interesting thing for some of the media to look into, frankly. Mm -hmm. But no, I'm not aware of any of that. But I wouldn't be surprised that mm -hmm some of his front organizations funneled money to uh, these progressive folks that are, you know, to the left, they're sure. running our state right now. That wouldn't surprise me one bit. Mm -hmm. Dave, we, we in our, in our office are, um, um, have not been holding public gatherings, public meetings um, for this duration. And, and we are about to, um, to break out and, and basically have a, a gathering in the near future showing a movie in his image, the AFA movie. Um, now, is that is that above? Is that going across the line in your your view uh, for us to um, venture out on that? Well, in my view, no, because again, I don't believe the governor's executive orders are legal. I don't believe they're constitutional. But you have to understand, they think they are, and they're going to enforce them. And so, right now, what's the limit on outside gatherings? I think it's a hundred people right now, or something like that. Um, you know, it, would the governor try to take some steps to stop you from doing that? She might, and hopefully you know who to call <laughs> if, they, if they do, because uh, we would definitely take that case up. But again, by, by the time you do that, hopefully the Supreme Court will have ruled and thrown out these executive orders, so it won't matter anyway. Or this uh, petition drive to get rid of the 1945 law will have been completed and be successful and then the executive orders won't apply either so either hey, way hopefully that'll that'll be the case that's very helpful now um so let's say for example we do get those three hundred forty thousand signatures it does sound very very good what will mm -hmm. be the next step so those are all gathered who do they go to tell me tell the they, process sure the process is they get turned into the secretary of state uh and i believe they're turning them in either later today we're here Friday, the September 25th. Uh, they're either doing it later today or Monday. I think they might be waiting to try to get some more signatures over the weekend. But they get turned into the Secretary of State. Then the Secretary of State has a period of time, mostly, as I understand, around 60 days, for them to review uh, the signatures and make a determination as to whether or not they think there's 340,000 valid signatures. And so obviously they don't look at every single signature. They don't have the manpower to do that, but they'll take samples and do representative sampling from the piles of signatures that get turned in and then take percentages and go from there. Either way, honestly, I expect it's gonna end up in court and uh, the governor and the attorney general will sue, whether they have grounds or not, they don't care. They'll just make something up and sue to try to stop it. And, uh, you know, and, and it'll probably get embroiled in the courts. But once the Secretary of State affirms there are enough valid signatures, then that 
petition drive, that, that ballot question gets sent to the legislature. And then the legislature can either take it up and pass it as it is with no changes, which is my understanding what they're going to do, or they can refuse to pass it. And then it would get put on the ballot for two years from now at the next major election in 2022, it would be on the ballot for the people to decide. And if the legislature passes that uh, ballot question and they approve it here this year, the governor cannot veto it. That's why this is so powerful. She can't stop it. That's and why I think they'll file a bogus lawsuit to try to stop it and do it that way through the courts. So they'll try to drag this on. Yes, absolutely. Now, and that's why people, and that's why it's so critical here with these elections here in a month, mm -hmm. because, you know, if the Republicans, I, you know, honestly, this is a Republican Democrat thing. I'm not saying the Republican party is wonderful and great. and They're all Christians or anything else. Of course not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but this is a Republican Democrat thing. And if the Democrats take control from this election next month of the house or the Senate, then of course it won't get passed by the legis. If it gets dragged out into next year, there'll be a new legislature, and so they won't pass it. So this election is critical too. People need to get out and vote, and keep those majorities in the House and Senate, so that if it does does get dragged out into next year, there's still people there who will pass it. Absolutely, well said. And as we're talking about the numbers game and the Republican Democratic thing and so on. We have great concerns in, in regards to uh, the, ele the voting in Michigan is coming up on November 3rd. And right. um, give us some of your perspective and uh, specifics in relationship to the fact now that votes coming in um, can, can be counted through for 14 days after the election. Right. Talk about that, would you? That, that's just judicial activism at its highest. I mean, you hear people talk about, are you an activist judge versus a judge who just follows the law? This demonstrates that to the max, okay? We have a law in Michigan. It's very clear. Our election law has been in place forever, you know, uh, mm -hmm. when we've been a state. And it says, votes shall be counted on the day, by the day, you know, of the election. There's no exemption, thing, exemption to go beyond that date or anything else. And so if you want to mail in a ballot through an absentee process or whatever the process is, you have to mail it well enough ahead of time so it's there by election day so it can be counted. What this judge did is just took a law which makes that crystal clear and says it must be you know, done by November 3rd and said, nah, I'm gonna change that. And now I'm gonna say it's 14 days from now. Under what authority? I mean, making it up out of thin air, okay? Just because and blaming the virus and blaming the mail system. You know, like like the mail system, it, it takes 14 days for a letter to get somewhere. I mean, that's just ludicrous. Mm -hmm. But that's the argument and that we're going to change it. And so now we'll count votes. Well, you know what that does. That means we won't know who's won Michigan for at least two weeks after the election. And that's being done on purpose and for political reasons to try to create as much uncertainty and problems around the country as possible because this isn't happening just in Michigan, it's in Pennsylvania, it's in other states also, where they're doing the same thing and extending these vote times. But you know, people are overlooking the, mm -hmm. the actually the worst, the, a worse part of that decision is beyond the, this 14 day thing where they'll count votes for 14 days past election day. They allow, the judge is allowing ballot harvesting. And if you're familiar with that phrase, it, it allows people to assist those uh, who might need help to get their ballot done. So think of elderly and folks who are in nursing homes and things like that. Well, people can come in and help them and assist them. Honestly, vote for them and have them do their ballot. And then they harvest all these ballots. And then these operatives that they're, it's not at a polling place, it's not in the mail. It's just people out there filling up their trunk with votes. And then they go and drop them off at the uh, county clerk's office. You're telling me that that's not going to uh, invite fraud? That's outrageous. Mm -hmm. And this decision is allowing that also to occur. So I'll tell you, it's creating a scenario where right now, if that's still in place, and I know the legislature, in fact, I've talked to a couple of senators over there, 
they're going to try to intervene and fight this lawsuit. So here's another situation where the legislature is acting. Um, they're going to try to stop it. But if this is allowed to happen, I won't trust our results in Michigan. I'm not going to believe they're valid. And now you can see why the Democrats are going to say the same thing. They're going to say, well, if Trump wins just because he was so had such an overwhelming number in Michigan, if that were to happen, they'll say, oh, this isn't a fair you know, vote or anything. And it creates uncertainty and people will not trust the results. That directly undermines our form of government and undermines our system here. It's, it's outrageous what the Democrats are doing with this stuff. It is truly a frightening scenario, isn't it? And recognizing yes. this is happening in, in our in our very state. Yeah. And um, you you want you know I know that like there's poll watchers and that that's being encouraged by you know different different ones across the country from both right. sides. I'm sure. Um, right. But you know I know there's great concerns about Detroit, for example, certain areas in, in Wayne County, but not just that area. But uh, you know what do you think the chances are that there will be uh, a balanced um, Number, you know, people from both sides in, in those contested areas. Who knows? <laughs> you know, that, that's the problem. Nobody mm -hmm. knows. What mm -hmm. good does it do to have poll watchers watching mm -hmm. at the actual poll, you know, where people come in and vote and making right. sure everything's done right? And I'm not saying we shouldn't do that. Of course we should. Um, that's important. But when you've got all these people harvesting ballots and mm -hmm. filling up their trunk with ballots, yeah. What good is a poll watcher for that? And what, you know, how is there any assurance that those va those ballots that are being brought in by private people, you know, piles of them exactly. are valid? What, what proof do you have of any of that? You have none. Yeah. And what I find is, and where this has happened in other states, isn't it funny how 90% of those ballots seem to go for the left winging left wing mm -hmm. candidate? You know, and so of course it's very concerning. Dave, you, um, what do you think the chances are of those senators being able to actually pull some kind of a strategy together uh, and be able to counter this or, or stop it or get a different decision? Well, I, again, it, you hate to say this, but it depends on what kind of judge you get and who you get in front of. Um, it depends on what the appellate courts are gonna do, but they're gonna try to intervene. I know for sure they actually publicly announced that yesterday, it was in the media that they're going to intervene in the court case and then try to have a standing then to appeal that decision. Because see, the case right now is what we call a friendly lawsuit. You have this left progressive group, this Michigan you know, retired association, whatever they call themselves, um, who brought the lawsuit. And then they sue the Secretary of State and the Attorney General, who present no evidence in the case, roll over and, and essentially agree with what the plaintiff, this retired organization group is asking for. And then they agree with it and the judge enters this ruling. And then who would appeal it? I mean, the plaintiffs aren't gonna appeal it, they won. And the attorney general and the secretary of state wanted it to happen, they're not gonna appeal. There was nobody really contesting the other side in that case. That's why you call it a friendly lawsuit. There was no adversarial position, no adversary back and forth presenting a valid other side to the judge. Right. And so that's the problem. That's why the legislature is going to try to intervene and then they will appeal it. Mm -hmm. So we'll see. Hey, now here's, here's a question that uh, I'm sure is up on the minds of, of many people in, in, including you. Uh, but so this is the Michigan scenario and we know that that's true in other states as well. And of course there's, there's broad based concern regarding the, in the integrity now of, a, of our electoral system. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, so let's say, for example, that, you know, that as we're seeing with all these Trump rallies, that there's a massive turnout for, for President Trump. And yet when it comes to the, the final vote after we wait for all these votes to come in, it's a thin margin and Trump is uh, ahead, well, first the, sen the scenario of his being ahead, um, you know, or, or behind, what do, you, what do you think that chaos is going to result in? Um, do, do you think that's where we're really heading? Is It's going to come sure. down to a showdown, don't you think, either way? Absolutely. You're going to see lawsuits flying from all sides on this one, and it's all going to end up at the U.S. Supreme Court is where it's going to end up. And mm -hmm. we're now going to have Supreme Court justices deciding who won. And if you don't think that could happen, look what happened in year 2000 with the Bush-Gore case. 
That's exactly what happened. And it was a 5-4 decision that put uh, President Bush in office. One vote came, on the Supreme Court. It came and down so, to Florida. Then. It came down to yeah, Florida. Yeah, came in the hanging chads and all that stuff. And folks forget that sort of thing. But that's how close we came to having, you know, a, a whole different scenario for eight years uh, back in the early 2000s. So, yeah, I think it's going to end up at the court. And that's why, frankly, this whole thing about replacing Justice Ginsburg is so important. Mm -hmm. That's why I hope the Republicans will follow through and President Trump is clearly going to nominate someone and that they will do that as soon as possible so that we have nine justices on the bench who can then decide. You know, because this is going to come down to the Supreme Court, in my opinion. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah you know, and, and how, is, how is it that if on the 21st of uh, January uh, that there hasn't been a determination, then they defer to the, the Speaker of the House, which is Nancy Pelosi. Right. I mean, I'm sure that they've got this. There's been, uh, but there's been a, a coalition of 100 people. I think you're familiar with that material that... Um, Right. You know, different war possible camping war camp possibility this scenario that scenario um, they've thought this through and right. I'm sure that there's many that are looking at that as being their escape hat hatch right. you think and, so and I, I think so and and you want to talk about fomenting <laughs> problems in our country put Nancy Pelosi in as as the president you will have widespread civil disobedience and fights and everything going on. It'll be awful. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what'll happen if that happens. And, and frankly, right now, I think it's ridiculous the threats that are coming from the left and the Democrats that if president Trump wins, you know, by some stretch of their you know imagination, because they don't think that should be, but if he wins, they're, they're going to the streets, they're going to riot and burn and they're threatening people trying to threaten people out of voting for President Trump. It's pathetic what they're doing. Truly it is. Uh, Dave, when you consider Michigan uh, in contrast with many other states from the standpoint of the, uh, the population, uh, where do you see Michigan in regards to um, activism, liberal activism uh, compared to, to many other locations? Do you think we're, we're better off at some point? I mean, are you, are you at least recognizing some some positive in that regard, or or maybe the east side of the state, west side of the state contrast? I don't sure. Know. Yeah, I, I think Michigan is like most of the country. We're not like New York. We're not like California. You know, the the liberal bastions where where they do what they want. You know, and their their crazy policies are coming home to roost for them. But Michigan's more like the rest of the country. You you've got folks on all sides. But you have this middle where it's just the average person really doesn't know what's, you know, they don't follow politics. They don't know what's going on, but they see rioting in the street and burning down buildings and people losing their businesses, police officers getting shot, that sort of thing. And they go, ah, I know I don't like that. Okay. And that's why I think you're going to see those folks moving in large part towards President Trump and, and towards, uh, you know, sanity, frankly. Um, so I, I'm optimistic in that sense, but it is, you know, uh, uh, discouraging when you look at how many people, you, you know, support this rioting and looting and things that are going on. I must say, though, that it is interesting how, you notice nothing's been happening in Detroit. Yes. <laughs> you know, we have not had these problems in Detroit. And you know why? Because we have a Democrat mayor and a Democrat chief of police who are standing up and saying no. We're not going to let that happen. You come here and riot, we're taking you down, you know. And that police chief, Mr. Craig, I, I, I got to admit, I think there's a Democrat I'd vote for, okay, <laughs> because he's standing up and saying, no, there's law and order. We're going we're gonna to maintain it here in this city. And so yeah. you're not seeing those issues in our state. You know, there's a little bit that happened in Grand Rapids and a couple other places, but it's been pretty short-lived and has been tamped down, which is, I think, encouraging for our state, for sure. Sure. Yeah, you know, I, I, uh, we're working on our newsletter right now, and it's, um, the title of it is uh, the, the, the Revolution That Is Upon Us. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a discussion about what are we in a revolution. Uh, I don't think there's any doubt that we're in a revolution. There's some that say we're in the middle of a re revolution, and there are others, and I include myself in this, saying 
know the revolution. We are deep into the resolution to the revolution. Mm -hmm. I believe we're in clo we're close to losing the whole thing. I wonder what your thoughts are in regards to that. Yeah, I think you know the more people stand back and are afraid to speak out and are afraid to stand up for for truth and for fairness and sanity in our in our uh, state and in the country, the more the folks the minor the vast minority on the left gets empowered and they they keep moving forward. You know, you look back in history at the 1917 revolution in Russia, the you know all that happened there. The vast majority of the people were not with the communists. You know, but they won because of their violence and killing people and taking over that sort of thing. You look at China with Mao, same thing. You know, if if the vast majority of people don't stand up, there's going to be you know, you get what you get. I mean, history shows us that. Um, I think, thankfully, in our country, at least right now, we still have a lot of people who are going to be willing to stand up and who are going to fight. And so, but yeah, I, I mean it. You know, if you haven't seen, I don't know if you know the actor, Jim Caviezel. He well, was, I haven't uh, seen it. The Infidel, right? You, the movie. Yes, The Infidel, yeah. the movie. But he was on Fox and Friends last weekend. I think it was on yeah. Saturday. Yeah. You should go. I encourage people to go on Google or, or go on YouTube. His interview with Pete Hegseth on Fox and Friends last week was one of the most powerful interviews I have ever heard of people standing up and understanding that accommodation and appeasement is not a choice. And this is where I think, Bill, an, a misunderstanding of our form of government and how we operate is so rife in the Christian community and pastors don't get it and churches don't get it. They say, Romans 13, Romans 13, you know, we have to do what the government says. We're supposed to obey and all that sort of thing. That is not what scripture teaches. It says if they're there to do good and they're there to protect and that sort of thing, of course you work with them. There's instances all through scripture, you know, from the apostles who were told not to preach in Jesus' name. They said, hey, we're going to obey God rather than men. I mean, civil disobedience is all through scripture. The Hebrew midwives, and you can go on and on. And so this idea that Christians and churches have to just obey the government is ridiculous. And that's what led to what happened in Germany, is the churches going along with it. And not necessarily out there actively saying we agree, they were silent about it. And I encourage people to understand our form of government. You know, Jesus said, give unto Caesar that which is Caesar and unto God that which is God's, right? We all know the verse, okay? Who, let me ask you a question, all my Christian friends out there who might be watching this, the pastors. Who's Caesar in our country? Who's Caesar? Is it Governor Whitmer? Is it President Trump? No, they're not Caesar in our country. Caesar is we the people. Caesar is our representative form of government. It's our republic. You have a Christian duty to be involved and to not just sit back and say, oh, well, the government's telling us to do something. You are the government. <laughs> wake up, wake up. And when they start coming in and telling you, you can't meet, you can't hold church, you can't do this, what is going on? Where are the Christians in our state going, no, we're, we're not obeying government when they start telling us to do something scripture says specifically we should do. And that's why I'm glad, at least in Michigan, because of our lawsuit and frankly, God's intervention, we're still allowed to meet. But around the country, you're seeing that infringed on more and more and more. And so people need to wake up. Caesar in our country is us. Wake up. That's fantastic, and I think that in, even in the light of what you said about Detroit, the mayor and, yes. the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the police chief police there. Chief, I commend them for their stand and what they're doing. Fantastic. Absolutely. And he's, I, I saw interviews with the chief of police, and yeah. he was a good communicator, too. I mean, he was bold. Yeah. He was strong. You know, he, yet he was reasonable, and he was yes. out there. He wasn't yes. hiding someplace. And yep. um, that's, that is very, that's, that's a real picture of what can yeah. happen if, if, if people stand rightly. Even right. from the Democratic side, I think that even makes it more. It's Absolutely. Easier. This is, yeah. and, and while unfortunately a lot of this is Republican and Democrat, there are a lot of pro-life Democrats. There are a lot of conservative Democrats who are afraid to speak up and afraid to act because they get slapped down in their own party. They need to start standing up and saying enough is enough. 
and in dealing with these issues. I, this is not a Democrat Republican thing. This is a, a Republic versus socialism thing. This is a, are we gonna have our system of government we've had for almost 250 years now, or are we gonna go the way of Cuba and Venezuela? That's what we're facing. That is the choice. And that's why people should listen to Mr. Caviezel, who was interviewed last week on Fox and Friends. It's one of the most powerful two minute segments. It was at the end of his interview. It was about a five minute interview. It, it was powerful. You, people need to see that and watch that. I appreciate your stating that. There's other questions I would ask you, but you have finished so strongly here, and I wanted to keep you to an hour because I know you got many polls. This has just been a, a great hour, and you have. I love to see your heart and your fight. You know, and I bet you if you've you, you've made the statement, if your dad were alive today as former circuit court judge, and he wouldn't recognize our state, he would. That's right. They would just they would just cry out to God, I'm sure, and yeah. uh, be joining right together with with you and with me and others like us. Oh, absolutely. I, I I can remember when I was a kid and I'd go around. My dad would be speaking in churches or at different things, and he was predicting the sorts of things that are happening right now. My dad was predicting 40, 50 years ago was going to be coming because of the way court cases were going, because of the way society was going, because of the way education was going. He was saying, look out, Dave. He said, this is coming. You're going to have to deal with it. He said, I'll be gone. And he was right. <laughs> you know, he's up in heaven. But now, and, and I look at it, I mean, for most of my life, I haven't had to deal with it. It's more my son, you know, he, and his, my grandkids. What kind of world are they? Are they going to have a free world? Right. I, right. If, if the left is allowed to do what they're doing, they will not live in freedom. It's that simple. That's the choice. People need to stand, they need to stand up. They certainly do. David, just to, I, I'm going to just add that my, and when we talk about this revolution, you have mentioned the word socialism. I believe that socialism, communism, Marxism, Maoism, China, the BL, the, the, the Black Lives Matter, the Antifa, and the Democratic Party loaded with, with communists now in those ranks. Um, we are being, we have a war that is now of, of, of the most significant, um, um, that's going to have the most significant consequence of anything yeah. we've ever been in, in our lifetime yeah. it's for, for rallying and for, and for standing and for praying. Um, anyway, this is a, it's been a great time and I'd like to, I'm going to ask you to close in prayer. Before sure. we, now, would you, if you would just give us your, um, like your contact information for anybody that would like to know how, where to turn in time. Sure. Time. Yeah, we'd be glad to. Um, we have an organization called Great Lakes Justice Center. Maybe folks have heard about that who've been involved in a lot of these lawsuits. And we have, of course, our, our private law firm's uh, site. So Great Lakes Justice Center is, the website is greatlakesjc, for Justice Center, .org, greatlakesjc.org. We have a contact thing on there. If you have an issue going on in your area, you can email us. Our phone number is on there. The phone number actually comes to my law office. And then our law office uh, website is commonlegal.com. It's just K-A-L-L-M-A-N and the word legal, L-E-G-A-L.com. And uh, you can check out our website there. Also, if people want to email me, Dave at commonlegal.com. And uh, I'd be happy to, to respond. We're getting lots of calls and uh, emails from people. This stuff is happening all over the state, all over the country, really. We're getting calls, Just talk, I just talked to somebody in Utah the other day. Um, we're getting calls from all over the place. So that's our contact information and Great Lakes J, uh, uh, Justice Center is a 501c3 uh, organization. And so um, we, we do a lot of cases there, focus on constitutional issues, right to life, good governance, those sorts of issues, which are right at the heart of everything that's happening. So, and, home, and homeschooling as well. And homeschooling, absolutely, yeah. So thanks for this opportunity, Bill. It's been a real pleasure to be with you today. I appreciate it. Great. I really appreciate it. Let's do it again sometime. Absolutely. Close, close in prayer. Thanks so All right. much. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for our country, our state, and those you do put in authority. We realize and recognize that you put folks in authority. And uh, help us to understand our duty and our responsibility to our country and our communities. And Lord, just help us all to stay close to you during these times 
and to rely on you more and more and uh, to help, help give us the wisdom and the vision to know how we should be responding in these trying times. And that it's okay to attack ideas, but it's not okay to attack people. And that we want to support that and listen to everybody, but we want to uphold truth in your word. So help us to do that in all that we do every day. And we know you're in control no matter what happens in our country here. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks again, Dave. Great time. No problem. Thanks. Talk to you soon. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.